We better keep an eye on these clouds. Operator, operator, this is an emergency call. I want the Elmville Weather Bureau. One time I was on a flight. We were delayed. The guy was frustrated. Yes, the bottom is touching the ground. You know, I told him, it's like, oh, I think the weather's bad to where we're flying, so that's probably why we're delayed. And he told me, I was like, oh, you can't trust, you know, the weather forecast, the weather forecast is always wrong. And then immediately he asked me, so it's like, oh, so what do you do? Well, I teach meteorology, I teach, I teach the weather. One of my favorite aspects of atmospheric science is how it can involve all of these fields at such a high level, really the peak of humanity's understanding of the world, yet can still be explained at a basic fundamental level everyone can talk about the weather. To forecast the weather, first we need to set the ground rules of the game. If physics is applied math, atmospheric science is applied physics. We need to borrow some of their rules. From physics, we use force equals mass times acceleration, Newton's second law. The stronger the force, the larger the acceleration. The larger the mass, the more force I need to accelerate it. We also need to borrow some rules from chemistry. Hot air rises. Because warmer air has more energy, the particles spread out more, increasing the volume, but the mass stays the same. This means the density will be less than the surrounding air, and the warmer air will float above the cooler, denser air, and thus hot air rises. The atmosphere is a fluid. Air can sink or float in the same way as an object in a river or on the ocean. From thermodynamics, we borrow the rule that any object with a temperature emits radiation. That means you and me, the Earth, and the Sun are continuously emitting radiational energy at a specific wavelength. The temperature of an object determines the rate at which energy is emitted and at what wavelength. This is incredibly important to atmospheric science, as certain wavelengths are essentially ignored by our atmosphere and some are absorbed. So remember before when I said hot air rises? Hot air rises. It actually doesn't. There's colder air above warmer air. Much colder air. If hot air rises, why is it hottest at the surface? Air goes from areas of high pressure to low pressure, but there's no air pressure in space. If that were true, the atmosphere would get sucked out into space. Gravity pulls things down towards the center of the Earth Yet our atmosphere doesn't get squished onto the surface, making us have to crouch to breathe air. The air we breathe extends for kilometers above us. The part of the atmosphere we live in is called the troposphere. 75% of the atmosphere is found in the troposphere, and it is on average only 12 kilometers thick. That's less than the distance from downtown Albany to Troy. The atmosphere is not the same thickness everywhere. There are large differences across the globe. The troposphere can vary from 6 kilometers at the poles to 17 kilometers at the tropics. Why is there this difference? The balance between Earth emitting radiation and absorbing it from the sun is around 38 degrees latitude. Everything in between receives a surplus of energy. The Earth receives more energy than it loses. And everywhere above those latitudes is an energy deficit. The Earth loses more energy than it receives. Now this couldn't be the only temperature control of the Earth. Otherwise, above 38 degrees north, the Earth would always be losing more energy than it receives, and it would be very cold in Albany. Because hotter air is less dense than cooler air, the warmer air of the tropics will expand to higher heights than the air above the Arctic. The atmosphere is a fluid, so why doesn't it flow from the equator towards these lower heights at the poles? That is because air in motion is balanced by the Coriolis force. What is the Coriolis force? The Coriolis force isn't real. Huh? I just here, thought you said- Let me explain. So I have this chess piece here, and when I apply a force to it, it accelerates in the same direction. If I push the piece while the car is moving at a constant speed, the same thing happens. But now, we'll try while turning. 
Suddenly, another force appears. What happened? We violated Newton's law. Well, it turns out the centrifugal force, the force that pushed the piece off right in front of me, is not a real force. It is an apparent force. Because our reference frame, the inside of the car, does not take into account the fact that we are turning, any forces from this turning are said to be apparent forces. Just like how the centrifugal force only acts on the piece when we're turning, the Coriolis force is always acting on any moving object on our rotating Earth. So, the sun unevenly heats the Earth, the atmosphere is thicker in the tropics, thinner in the poles, it wants to spill out towards the poles. This is balanced by the Coriolis force, which is caused by the rotation of the Earth, and the result of this balance is the jet stream. The jet stream is one of the biggest clues to forecasters on what to expect in mid-latitude regions of the Earth. It can be used to forecast cold fronts, warm fronts, cyclones, vorticity, hurricane interactions, temperature, and a whole lot more. One of the main things meteorologists look for when forecasting is some form of lifting mechanism. This is a measurement from a sensor attached to a weather balloon. We see here temperature and dew point are plotted. Meteorologists use skew tees, which is sort of a vertical graph paper for the atmosphere. We can use these other lines to show what would happen if the air is lifted. Now that the air has been lifted to the point where the temperature and dew point have run into each other, what happens now? We've formed a cloud. Once the air is completely saturated, the humidity is at 100%, there's no reason why the air can't keep rising. The cloudy air cools at a slower rate and is now warmer and less dense than the surrounding air. When air reaches this level, no more energy is required and it will rise on its own. When we look at this from a forecast standpoint, we can forecast things like precipitation type, whether it's going to snow or rain or freezing rain or sleet. You know, I recall a particular event about a decade ago now where a major snowstorm was forecast in Albany. I felt pretty confident with my forecast. The University at Albany closed, classes were canceled. And what happened was there was a break in the precipitation with just enough warm air about a kilometer or two above the surface that came in. And as I talked about, that little warm layer of the atmosphere caused enough of that snow to fall to melt. And we ended up with a really big sleet storm. And sleet is much of a lesser impact than a big snowstorm. And so uh, it was a real busted case and a very, very challenging forecast. You really uh, learn a lot from those cases. We learn about what to look at in advance of these cases so those, those types of forecast busts don't happen. The equations of physics can be used to model the atmosphere. They can also be projected forward in time to create a forecast, but the calculus cannot be solved by hand. By the time you finish solving the last equation, the day you were forecasting for would have already passed. Significant advancements in forecasting did not come until the invention of the supercomputer. These machines allow us to compute the required equations at a speed fast enough to make numerical weather predictions. Something many people don't realize is that we do not know what the weather is right now. We receive data such as temperature and humidity from ships, oil platforms, geostationary satellites, radar, balloon, planes, so much, but we do not know what is in between. We compile all these data sources and using math, essentially guess what is in between. When we make a weather forecast, um, because we don't have the exact temperature and pressure and other variables we measure in the atmosphere at every single point and measure it accurately. We introduce errors that way. Additionally, we don't have perfect weather models. 
we have to make assumptions about atmosphere processes and that also introduces errors into models. So whenever those two errors then grow, when we uh, run these computer simulations, as we go further out in time, eventually you can't make a weather forecast. This is why it is important to understand the difference between deterministic and probabilistic forecasting. A meteorologist should take into account the confidence level of the forecast and inform the public how likely something is going to happen and not what one model says is going to happen. Weather models depend on a very good initial condition. You need to know the initial state of the atmosphere pretty well in order to make a, a very accurate forecast. You, you can imagine, you know, it's like bowling. If, if, you're, if you're standing in a wrong lane, you try to hit a strike in your own lane, then it's gonna be really hard if you know, you're standing, you know, you're not in the right position to do that. Meteorology is one of the oldest and newest sciences. People have been looking up to the sky trying to understand the weather for thousands of years. It is also one of the newest due to recent advancements in radar, satellite, and computational power. The accuracy of our forecasts has greatly improved over the decades. Oh, what an incredible feat it is to even be able to forecast with some level of confidence what the weather is going to be like over the next several days is a pretty major scientific feat. Anything beyond that is seasonal or climate forecasting. Climate models, on the other hand, require a good estimate of the chemical composition in our atmosphere is changing, how solar radiation is changing. It's things that we actually have a good idea about what's going to happen. The gases in the atmosphere that select what type of energy they absorb are known as greenhouse gases. As more greenhouse gases enter our atmosphere, the delicate balance between the Earth, the Sun, and the atmosphere is upset. We know CO2 is rising in the atmosphere. CO2 is a greenhouse gas. So that traps more um, heat in the atmosphere. And we also know there are various feedbacks in the climate system that will amplify that warming. So based off physics and based off our physical understanding of the climate system, we can expect the climate to warm as we continue to increase greenhouse gas emissions. Climate change is the great exacerbator of problems. It doesn't cause them per se, but it makes them worse. Climate change changes the average in Albany, if it warms four or five degrees Fahrenheit over the next hundred years, our climate is gonna feel more like Washington, D.C. Everyone everywhere is impacted differently. We're gonna have more record highs in Albany because in our current climate, we, we don't get not that hot that often. When climatological averages as a whole change, this is significant. One of the signals of climate change that's already occurring is that when you look at the ratio of record highs to record lows, it's much greater than one. So that's not to say we can't still have record lows. It's just that we have so many record highs. As scientists, it's not only our job to create knowledge, do research, and understand our climate system better and understand what may happen in the future, but I think more and more of us are realizing that we have to be the messengers of the science as well. We can't just rely on the science to kind of sit there and for it then to be consumed by the public and politicians for them to make good decisions. Hopefully we get to a point where international community can address climate change just because it is an international problem. One country can't do it alone. Hopefully there's an urgency for that to be done because the longer we wait to reduce greenhouse gases, the harder it will be to prevent the global mean temperature from warming to dangerous levels. The science is improving, but it is not impervious to mistakes. There's so many people across different disciplines working on this problem. Atmospheric science is a difficult field, and it is so important to listen to those who dedicate their lives to the study of the atmosphere, so you don't have to. Start over.